place has had a culture of corruption and a culture of obstruction for too long. End of the light, the private eye who put Broward Public, Broward Health's public health system under state and federal scrutiny. Wayne Black is here with us this morning. All along, uh, we felt uh, we were very positive this would happen. Changing course, Cuba relents, and Carnival will sail with Cuba-born U.S. citizens. It's a crooked system. It's a system that's rigged. The brash and outrageous Donald Trump, remember him? Well, his new campaign manager says, hey, it was all an act. We will take that to the roundtable. Good morning and welcome. We begin today with a side of the story we rarely see, a look behind the scenes of a government investigation. Both the state and federal agencies are looking into allegations of corruption, waste and misdeeds at Broward Health, the huge taxpayer-funded medical system. In politically charged maneuvers, the Broward Health Board debated what to make about those public uh, allegations of corruption. The board chair was suspended, reinstated, and then he quit. The district general counsel was put on job watch. The private investigator hired to find who and what was going wrong was taking findings to law enforcement when his services were terminated. And you will hear from Wayne Black. First, though, some background from Local 10's Bob Norman. We are in the realm of the absurd right now. Broward Health is in full crisis mode. This is the most bizarre fact pattern and unbelievable failure. Facing both federal and state investigations in the January suicide of its CEO, Nabil El Sanadi, the board of the health care system that receives about $150 million in taxes, voted to install a new interim CEO, Pauline Grant, and terminate the services of private detective Wayne Black, whose work uncovered corruption at Broward Health and sparked those investigations. Outside attorney Mitchell Berger, who was hired to coordinate Broward Health's response to those investigations, portrayed Black as uncontrollable and criticized him for turning his findings of kickbacks over to FBI agents. That's not what a private investigator is supposed to do. Black previously complained that Broward Health General Counsel Lynn Barrett had obstructed federal agents from getting key information. You've been accused you. of very serious things, obstructing an FBI investigation. You're not going to comment? No, sir. Now, Barrett did deny obstructing that federal investigation today, but the board voted to put her own employment on a 30-day review during which she'll have to justify her job performance. In the video report, I'm Bob Norman, Local 10 News. And here today with us is Wayne Black, an investigator almost 40 years in both public and private sectors, including as a public corruption unit supervisor in Janet Reno's then Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office. In 2003, his investigation at Broward Health led to the federal indictment and conviction of the then Chief Financial Officer. Wayne Black has not spoken publicly about this latest investigation until now, and we thank you for coming in this morning and appreciate uh, what you're about to do, and I know the First Amendment is very important to you. It is. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Great to have you here. If we can, Wayne, and I'm going to use first names since we've known each other since the early 80s, uh, give us some background. How did you first get involved with Broward Health? I was approached by Dr. El Sanadi, the then CEO, um, to come in and do some work. They did not have a security director at the time like Memorial and other hospitals have. Mm -hmm. And he was, there were several things he wanted to do. First, he was concerned about the image uh, between Broward Health and law enforcement. There was this bunker mentality, which later turns out to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to talk about a threat assessment. Uh, are the groups like pediatrics secure enough? Uh, compared with other hospitals. And then there were some vague allegations of corruption. Well, that soon changed uh, right. when he told me that. That became a, the focus eventually, but initially it was on general security for Broward Health, the large system. 7,500 employees, what, four or five hospitals? Uh, a huge system. 7,900 great employees and a huge system. Um, and uh, so what eventually happened is. Um, there was a, a witness, a source, and he said, we have an allegation from this witness about a contract, about the security contract that's pending, and we talked to that one, and it just sort of expanded from there. And it, the corruption investigation took, the, took control. Was that the 
so the original scope of your work was not that when Dr. El Sinati hired you. Dr. El Sinati, people may know, the CEO committed suicide in, yes. in January. December, I believe it was. Was yeah. it December? So, um, Wayne, I pulled a, a letter that you had written January 29th to the General Counsel of Broward Health, uh, essentially accusing her of blocking cooperation with the FBI, blocking any investigation. It's a pretty serious letter. What are the details of as much as you can say. The investigation that you think she was blocking, what did she do? Well, this is really the second uh, letter. The other one isn't public yet. I, I wrote one, in, uh, I think, in September, the same thing, urging her, uh, her name is Lynn Barrett, to allow me to complete the investigation. I was there before she was, recall. I got there in, uh, originally in, in September of 2015. And then she came later, then, then there was a corporate integrity agreement. What I wanted her to do was allow me, an experienced investigator, to handle evidence and refer evidence that we found and sources directly to law enforcement, whether it's the FBI or the, <coughs> the IG's office or local law enforcement. And she wanted to run that through one of her law firms and they, would, they were billing at outrageous rates. Plus, they didn't need to know. I mean, from day one when Lynn Barrett got there, her, her law firms demanded to know the names of our sources and our witnesses that were talking about corruption. You couldn't give them up? We never gave them up. I mean, this whole thing has been about determining who the witnesses are, and of course, and we'll never give them up. Right. But that was, and that was part of the chilling effect that the allegations were that there was this chilled effect on the employees that, who wouldn't come, uh, wouldn't come out with anything they knew, and, and to your point, something like the general counsel was doing, allegedly, was exactly that point. Correct. So what, can you talk about the nature of what you were finding? Was it, and, and far be it from us to impede an FBI investigation, but a culture of corruption in theft, in embezzlement, in, I know, procurement at, at the health system is under investigation? Could detail as much as you can. What is it that's going wrong? Uh, you know, I probably don't know 80% of it because I've been sort of blocked and restricted along the way. But when you have, again, if you compare North Broward to Memorial, Memorial you can go in and get a public records request in seven to ten days. At, at Broward Health, it takes 30, 60, 90, 120 days because they run it through an outside law firm that bills. Even I, while I was working, my last day was last week, while I was working, even I had to make a public records request that took 60 days for me to get to look at one contract about something I was investigating. So it's that whole bunker mentality that's, that's different. Now, just so uh, people at home who especially live in Miami-Dade not know, may not know, is that Broward County has the North Broward Hospital District, which is called Broward Health, and then there is the South Broward Ho Hospital District, which is known as the Memorial System. And you were hired by the Broward Health. By North. By, the, the, I'm sorry. The former by, North Broward, yeah, yes. Former Broward North Health. Broward. And w when you looked at procurement practices, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to buy supplies and uh, other contracting services. Is that where you found the wrongdoing? Well, at, at first, yes. I mean, that's, I, I looked at the security contract at first. And what I did typically when we had a witness or a source of information, and they said they wanted to help and they had information. Rather than debrief them and spend a lot of time with them, I asked them if they would go to law enforcement. I referred them to federal, state, or local agencies. Mm -hmm. More recently, and we're getting calls now two or three times a day thanks to your coverage and what Bob Norman did in the Sun Sentinel, we're still referring people today, mm -hmm. depending on what they have Employees to say. Employees of the district who are calling and saying, I've got something I want to talk about? Yes, inside employees and also former employees and members of the community. Mm -hmm. So we've created this vehicle for them to be able to, to talk about it. What can you tell us about Brian Bravo, who is the district's former purchasing director, um, got a, a severance pay, is no longer with the district under some pretty heavy allegations. W where is he? Did you have anything to do with that investigation? Uh, and what did you find? Okay, I, I can't talk about a pending investigation. Uh, I, I'm not sure where he is. Um, or where anyone is that they that they made yeah. allegations about. The and Sun Sentinel has reported, excuse me, the Sun Sentinel has reported that Bravo is the subject of a grand federal grand jury investigation. Can you confirm that? Yeah, I can't. 
I can't. That Can would be you? just wrong for me to do okay. that. Can you talk about his district owned laptop, his materials, his office? Do you knew, do you know whether those things have been taken in as evidence? I don't know. I, I think those things are settled. Uh, in in the fall, uh, North Broward hired a uh, a great man named Carlos Perez, who is the now the security director, a former federal prosecutor. So he is exactly what they needed, and I, he's now the liaison with law enforcement. So I, yeah. I'm I'm sure things are fine now. Uh, if I can, uh, I want to make people at home aware that we have invited the uh, the board of commissioners, uh, the North Broward Hospital District, to join this conversation, and they issued a statement to us. And I'm going to put it up on the screen so people at home uh, hear their side as far as they wanted to go. Uh, they say it's important to distinguish that the ongoing investigations involving Broward Health are specific to contracts and procurement and have never involved the amazing and high quality care provided by our, by our doctors and nurses. These investigations were initiated by Broward Health. We continue to cooperate with government agencies and look forward turning the page. Uh, the one part of that, Wayne Black, that I would wonder about is did they initiate these investigations? Of course they did not. They did not. And, and, and since the time that I met the general counsel, they've done everything, the general counsel's office, not the district, but the general counsel's office to, to slow things down. I mean, look, how many hospital districts hire a law firm to interfere or to deal with the inspector general? It's public record. Nobody does that. Right. We have a, a couple of things we want to get to relative to that with the board, the changes on the board, the suspension and resignation of the chair, and we will get to all of that when we come right back. So stay with us. We are back with private investigator Wayne Black, who was working for the Broward Health System uncovering for the system and now really on your own uncovering witnesses to possible corruption and furthering the investigation there and you know I, I think in the public view very public suspension uh, of the board chair David DiPietro and Daryl Wright another uh, board member and the court case he eventually got reinstated the fa courts found that the governor had really no reason legally to suspend him uh, but then resigned because in his words there was just too much political interference into Broward Health and its operations. And I want to get your take on how politics is interfering with an investigation by the FBI. Well, I think it is. Recall that, that uh, there was a move at Broward Health to have all employees that wanted to give information come through one of their law firms. David DiPietro wrote that letter to all employees, all 7,900, that said, look, you don't have to go through our law firm. You go right to law enforcement. I encourage you to report. So he, I think he still had his hat on as a former state prosecutor when he wrote the letter. It was a great letter. And wasn't there a move to have the outside attorney sit in w on interviews with, with witnesses? And how appropriate would that have been? There was a move, and that happened. Out happen. Outside lawyers hired by the board of the general counsel set in during investigations with uh, interviews with with uh, witnesses, not not subjects, but witnesses during con about the contracts. So I would, I mean, personally, I wouldn't have allowed that to happen. But um, I guess they wanted to they they wanted to see what happened. They actually set in, and they didn't they did not represent the employee when they set in. They represented the board. And the purpose of them sitting in during the IG interviews was to find out what the IG was asking. So now, just can I just say with the, the whole board issue, now the new board, one of the new board members that was appointed by the governor just this week in a matter of days is, and now we're talking about the North District, is the attorney for a board member in the South District setting up a, what seems to be a real conflict of interest between the boards. I've been following that, and, and uh, the new board member for the North District, her name is Robeson, appointed in record time by the governor, represents Laura Miller, one of the board members of the South District, and they compete. But she sent the South District a $40,000 bill, apparently, just to deal with public records. Again, the public records issue comes up. It's, yeah, it's about the bunker mentality. Yeah. Uh, Wayne, I, I want to ask you, you had a close relationship, I know, with Dr. Nabil el Uh He was on this program uh, last year, uh, an impressive, just energetic, and 
seemed at the time to me, optimistic figure who wanted to develop, and here's some video of Dr. El Sinati, wanted to develop uh, uh, Broward Health into one of the best uh, health systems in the country. And then December, uh, he takes his own life. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with him and why you think he may have committed suicide. I wish I knew why he committed suicide. I'll tell you that first. But when I first met with him, he was very concerned. He was, I, I wouldn't say paranoid, but he thought his office was bugged. We planned on sweeping it. We would meet to talk about corruption at a, at a restaurant rather than his office. So mm -hmm. we had this little restaurant in Lauderdale by the sea where we would meet. And uh, he seemed like he was uh, gung-ho to clean the place up if there was a problem. Um, he gave me carte blanche to report anything I found to any law enforcement agency. I mean, you don't, and I told him, you don't hire me if you want to cover something up. Do you think that he might have had some involvement in anything? Did he know more than he might have told you? Do you think? Have you found evidence of that? I have no idea. I, I have no evidence of that. Um, I spoke with him probably two weeks before his death talked to him all the way through November and December, um, and I didn't get any indication that uh, yeah. anything was wrong. Uh, I guess the uh, North Broward Hospital District was formed, I believe, in about 1950, and we should point out the governor appoints the seven members of the board. So Democratic governors have appointed people of their choosing. Now, over the last five years, Rick Scott has appointed those of his choosing, and we should say, uh, in a nonpartisan fashion, that there's been charges of corruption and misdeeds for a long time in this hospital district. And Dr. El Sanati was trying to clean it up. I think he was. I mean, he was, he was energetic. Um, he met with, uh, with me in law enforcement. I mean, there, there are statements now by different people that he didn't know what we were doing, but he, he met with me in law enforcement off-site, and he was gung-ho. I mean, he was... Uh, yeah. He was loved by well, them. Well, even in last fall, was there, the hospital district settled for some, what, $70 million uh, allegations that they were paying doctors improperly yeah. for them to bring well, business. and admission. Paid. I mean, they yeah. paid it because they said, yes, we conspired to pay a select group of physicians extra compensation, which violated the law, and a whistleblower collected, I think, $12 million for being a whistleblower. That was before El Sonati got there. But you know what? Even if they didn't have that, they have a duty to report. They're a, the hospital district is a victim. I mean, this whole public records game that they play is like saying, uh, calling the police, someone broke into my house. But when the police respond to, to come in your house and get fingerprints, saying, oh, wait, you need a search warrant. Yeah. So we're the, we're before, the victims. Before we run out of time, I, I do want to say the state auditor general, inspector general, rather, uh, has played a major role in what has been going on. Do you think it's been a positive role? Has she acted within the bounds of what you think is correct? I mean, who knows? Um, they, they certainly needed some looking at. And, and remember, what they were doing was a public record audit. Everything that, that she came down and she sent her investigators to do was public record. Yet Broward spent all these legal fees, taxpayers' dollars, to, to try to obstruct that. So you are, technically, your contract is over. You, I, I saw the deadline was today for you to turn over some of your reports and pictures and documents, but you are still on the case on your own? We're going to be on the case. We're going to, we're going to, my firm is going to look at it. Last week was my last week. We turned over our notes. Uh, final reports due for me in 60 days, but we're going to, we're going to keep on uh, doing what uh, the Sun Sentinel does, what you do, what Dan Lewis does with his blog, um, and uh, if they're, uh, if they're corrupt, uh, I'm their worst nightmare. Wayne Black, uh, keep shining a light on dark places, particularly those involving a public trust and taxpayer money. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. And well, after the break, where are we going? We're going to take it all to the round table, including Cuba's reversal on the policy on Cubans returning there by sea. It is that time again, time for a closer look along with some informed opinion and analysis of the week's top stories with our powerhouse roundtable. <laughs> what a group we've got for you. Mark Caputo covers Florida politics for Politico and writes the Politico Florida playbook that lands in the email at oh dark hundred hours every morning. Rosemary O'Hara is the editor of the editorial page of the Sun Sentinel. Her page has followed closely all the developments at Broward Health. 
And a familiar face always, Marlon Hill is a Miami attorney with the Hamilton Miller and Berthesel firm, past president of the Caribbean Bar Association, and a roundtable regular. An all-star cast this morning. Welcome. Good Thank morning. You. Welcome. Great to have and you here. May, may we just point out the purple in honor of Prince. Shout out to yeah, Prince. Yeah, a lot more because a little dash. I saw that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, well, very subtle. We're, we're going to get to, I, I think, oh. phenomenal. And if you watched Saturday Night Live yeah. last night, a completely, a very moving tribute to Prince. But let's begin with sort of the some stories of the week. And yes, let's sir. begin, if we can, about Carnival Cruise Lines and the relenting by the Cuban government. Uh, Rosemary, I know your editorial page has been strong on this. In fact, got to the subject before the Miami Herald uh, editorial page. But the fact that the, the Cuban, the Castro government, would relent and say, okay, U.S. citizens born in Cuba can come back. I was frankly astounded that they agreed to it. Yeah, because, you know, the last thing Cuba wants is to take marching orders from Miami. Los Cusanos, the worms, as they call the exile community. And they, even though um, they now will allow Cuban-born Americans to arrive by sea, they still impose extra burdens on them. Right. You know, it, depending on when they emigrated or left, they have to get a Cuban passport. And, and it Cuba takes time and yes. it takes money to do it, too. Right, right. Well, you can't, you can't go unless they say you can go. That, that's everybody's. But you know, you know what was so interesting is that here, the, the PR crisis and legal maneuverings really affected Carnival. But what affected the Cuban government to profit? Well, and it's a, it's a sovereign diplomatic salsa dance that we're in the middle of right now, right? And it takes two people to, to be involved in that. But let's not forget that American-born citizens couldn't travel to Cuba at one time, right? So like our powerhouse oh, round table, really, right? colleague, um, HT said, you know, discrimination is discrimination, irrespective of which side of the shore um, there is. Um, so we need to be as outraged as we were against Carnival as before with this policy. And that's the kind of discussion that we're going through as this normalization process takes hold. Let's just marvel at how low the bar is for Cuba. Like, wow, they didn't act like jerks. We're really impressed. <laughs> and that, that's, that's really the kind of the takeaway for me on this is I wonder if they waited till the very last moment till all the bookings were due mm -hmm. and all the bookings were done so that there would be no passengers or spaces left anyway. And they say, yeah, we'll take you if you, you were born in Cuba and you're a U.S. citizen. Oh, but there's no room left. But it almost seemed like if you listen to, go back and listen to what the CEO said even a week ago or a week and a half ago, it sounds like they knew what was coming. Oh, just hold on. Oh, well, we're holding well, on. Well, they'd been working on it for a while. Really, though, I got to say I was surprised that Carnival let it drag on mm -hmm. as long as it did. It suffered a big black eye in this community. Mm -hmm. right. But did and they have a choice, Whether though? it can bounce back. Yes, yeah. oh, of course I don't it have did. to go there. Yeah, it didn't have to accept the yeah. dictator's rules. Well, you know, you and I know that there's several things happening behind the scenes with regards to this um, discussion between both governments. And we have to be very mindful. Even the National Bar Association, which is the National Black Lawyers Association, they're going to be traveling to Cuba next month with a large delegation, right? Um, and it's people to people. As of before, you didn't have that. Um, I, I think the important thing to remember is Norwegian, which has been pointed out in the Capitol Hill Cubans blog and by various members of the exile community. We talked when, about that. When Norwegian Cruise Line uh, had a problem in Africa because of a bias against Israeli citizens, they said, yeah. okay, yeah. we're not going to stop at your port. We're not going to go to Tunisia. Yeah, uh, I also, I would like to note that in his statement on uh, Friday, uh, Arnold Donald, the CEO of, uh, of Carnival, uh, he, he, I, I, the way he phrased it kind of, I don't know, rankled me a little bit. He said, well, there was all this noise going on, right. which I guess it's folks like us who are mm -hmm. the noise. But in fact, it was the larger community. It's what H.T. Smith said here a week ago. It wasn't just Cuban Americans. It was African Americans. It, it was Anglos. Everybody objected to this act of discrimination. Yes, yes. Um, well, they ended up doing the right thing. And they did. People over and principal. Right. And now I, I wonder who's going to book that cruise. Um, staying with Cuba, if we can, just for a minute, uh, I thought that it was fascinating that uh, this past week the Cuban Communist Party Congress met and uh, affirmed once again that Ra Raul Castro will be its leader for another five years, even though he is supposed to retire in 2018. And then Fidel came out and uh, gave his uh, valedictory, saying, "This really based the last time that you will see me." I don't many think many cheers were. Uh, tears were shed here about that. But I mean, what you've got is a gerontocracy. I mean, mm -hmm. this, 
you know, wonderful <laughs> <Gerontocracy>, <laughs> it's good. country. I mean, this vibrant, okay. this place that could be so vibrant. Uh, where are the leaders? I mean, uh, Diaz Canel, who is supposed to be the guy who takes over, is 54, but how long does he wait in the Others have waited in the wings and have perished in, in the process. I don't really know Cuba's government, but my, my guess is is that there is a, a well-established government there that once the Castros leave, if they ever die, will continue with many of the same yes. policies and much of the same dysfunction. Yeah, yeah. if I can, uh, let me put up on the board, uh, uh, Rosemary, I know I particularly like uh, David Brooks, the columnist in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. he, here's what he had to say on Friday about the future of Cuba. He is down there with a uh, National Endowment for the Humanities Group, if, we, if we've got that. Can we put that up on the screen? Well, we don't have it. Anyway, he says Cuba's short-term future, you can't be optimistic about it. Leaders are trying to square the mother of all circles to have a rich society, but without rich people to have an entrepreneurial class, but without uh, losing the egalitarian solidarity to have revolutionary socialism and also outside investment and growth. I mean, it, it's, it's a paradox what they're trying to achieve. Well, you know, they, 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 uh, the monies that are coming from the cruise lines, remember, this, at the end of the day, these tourists are going to be spending money in Cuba. So that's, that's the reason why they overturned their policy very quickly. Yeah, they, very need simply, that's it. Yeah. they need this infusion. They need this infusion. Rosemary, you sat here, watched Wayne Black yes. talk about Broward Health. I mean, just to have the private investigator on the case talking about it in public, was pretty remarkable, I thought. Did he say anything that surprised you? you? You've covered, you're in the trenches covering that story. Right, right. No, I can't say. Th I think the surprise for me was that he was here. I mean, I think it's a tough thing between the First Amendment and somebody hires you to do the investigation and then you go on TV and talk about it. But he was so frustrated by um, the district's um, inability to move things through that when Dr. El Sinati killed himself that he raised the flag and said, you know, there's bad stuff going on here and your legal department is sitting on it. So as he said, we're supposed to hear a review of the legal department this week. I'm already hearing that the new board makeup, now that the governor has, you know, did what he did, that the new board is not going to do that. There's a real question, you know, these are taxpayer supported, um, built hospital systems in Broward. Seventy years we've invested and yet the governor appoints all the members of the board and he's dictating what's happening in Broward County and there's a belief he wants to privatize them, sell them off. So Mark, you, you cover the governor. I mean the governor, he has a stated mission I believe from before the Broward health issue came up to look at public hospitals and rethink them. Well since, since his time as a private hospital guy, Rick Scott's always hated what he calls tax exempts. He doesn't even like to call them nonprofit hospitals. Mm -hmm. I think what it's time for is it's time for North Broward and South Broward to be one Broward. The idea that there are two hospital districts in the same county, whereas Miami Dade, which is a larger county, has only one hospital district, yeah. makes no sense. What, I, what really struck my ear here today is the investigator says, and you guys said, look, in 2003 there was an indictment. Here we are 16 years later. We've got more corruption. There is systemic rot, corruption, and a culture of yeah. at least opacity at that district. And well, clearly not, the yeah. culture needs to change. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not to try to put a happy face on any of this, but you did write, or your page wrote, uh, editorial, uh, I believe, yesterday, uh, maybe, I'm sorry, Friday, Saturday, where you said Pauline Grant, the interim CEO, yes. is a game changer. So there are some positive things going on there. Yes. Um, you know, there are so many political influences there on who's going to get what spot. She was not, for some board members, the preferred choice. But in the end, she was the right choice. And she's got, you know, this medal about her that is going to say, you know what? No politics here. Check it right. at the door. So for the moment, but so they're, they're in the process of finding a search firm to find a new CEO. Gosh, I'm hearing that even the process of finding that has a little hinkiness to it. Mm -hmm. but, but we're lucky we have Pauline Grant there. And it just, there needs to be a lot more sunshine on this organization. So speaking of hinkiness, we have much more hinkiness to talk about, and we will do so in a couple of minutes. Stay with us. Our state government is just dysfunctional, and this causes me to rethink how I can best serve the people of North Florida and our state. Floridians are hungry for new leadership, and I'm so excited to tell you first that I'm seriously considering running for governor in 2018. 
That is Congresswoman Gwen Graham of North Florida, daughter of Bob and Adele Graham, former governor, senator, and finishing her first term in the U.S. House of Representatives and now living, representing a district where she cannot get reelected. And Mark, uh, uh, even in only one two-year term, Gwen Graham has, I think, done a formidable job. Yeah, I made the mistake of, of informally betting that there was no way she'd win her district in 2014. It was a midterm Republican year, kind of a Republican-leading district. She won it. Democrats are really excited right now. Over They're, an incumbent. Yeah, over an incumbent, correct. Democrats are really excited by right now, like, wow, maybe we finally can have a winner. Democrats haven't had that seat since 1998 in the governor's mansion. So what does that mean, seriously considering That means I'm running, running for office. Yeah. Seriously yeah. considering means she's definitely running. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be shocked if she doesn't it was, actually It was Jeb Bush who told Glenna and me uh, before he formally announced six months before, I'm seriously thinking about running for president. Right. I'm seriously and we consider that being uh, first for us. Right? Well, I, I would take it that way. This is an exciting announcement. Up until now, those who we thought were the Democratic bench strength were the mayors. So Bob Buckhorn of Tampa, mm -hmm. you know, um, Buddy Dyer in Orlando. But um, Gwen, that she won in a conservative in North Florida, that right. she can win up there. She's seen as a moderate. She fought, I mean, her, her, her father, Governor, former Governor Bob Graham has such good name recognition still and a good reputation. So I, I really think uh, yeah. this is this shows the Democrats have some bench strength. And doesn't Absolutely. doesn't that the, the Graham name gives her an edge that a Buckhorn might not have? Well, she's a daughter of Miami and yeah. South Florida, and where state, the, the largest largest votes are, are here in our region. And before she moved to Tallahassee, and she's also a woman, which let's not forget that right. our state is divided into three: North, Central, and South. And she's covered the North, and she's from the South. Yeah. But and Alex, Alex Sink was a woman, too. Yeah, but, she, but she ran an awful campaign. Yes, to, your, to your point about Buckhorn, okay, Bob Buckhorn runs. You've got, think about how, how many Demo centrist Democrats from Tampa have run and lost. You got Bill McBride, you have Jim okay. Davis, you have Bill McBride's wife, Alex Sink, and then you have Charlie Crist. Now, the, the Democrats would nominate a fifth in Tampa Mayor Bob Buckhorn. I just really wonder at what point the Democrats are going to say, enough with the Democrats who keep losing from Tampa Bay. Right. Well, I, I like, I, I, excuse me, I like the, the idea of Adam Putnam, the yes. state ag commissioner, up against Gwen Graham. You've got two attractive, uh, uh, rising young politicians. Old You're Florida. shaking, shaking no, your No, I'm, I'm agreeing. It's What's a that? battle of did old you, Florida. Did you write that? Someone wrote that. Yeah, I, I, I run on Twitter. It's, it is yeah. a battle of old Florida. I mean, I think Putnam is related to the uh, Putnams of Putnam County fame. Big land oh, holding, right? yeah. long time agricultural family. Right. I, again, I, I think I, I found are. that on the internet, but who knows? Well, the Grams, I, I, the Grams I, I, are you know, a dairy family. They from Miami Lakes. Lakes. Yeah. Yeah. Putnam is a very attractive candidate. Unlike our current governor, Adam Putnam has the ability to articulate a message and to explain himself and to yeah. say why. He's not been, he, he'll mention, he'll agree that the climate change is real. It's just a question of what are we going to do about it, is where the politics happen. So I think this week was a week where we saw a real clear uh, lineup of who we're going to see running for governor. And you guys Gwen sound Graham, like you want to fast Button. track this to 2016 as opposed to 2018. It's already here. 2016 yeah, 2018, yeah. yeah. Well, since, oh, 2018. Yeah. Now that you brought Rosemary, that up. Rosemary, since you have mentioned <laughs> our governor, let me point out, uh, I know that uh, Mark Caputo and I spent Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at the Diplomat Hotel at the Republican National Committee uh, spring meeting. And the featured speaker at the Thursday luncheon was Governor Rick Scott, who got up and he gave, I guess, a pretty good speech, nothing too inspiring. Uh, but he did not say, I am behind Donald Trump. He should be the nominee. And then he went outside and to the gaggle of media said, Donald Trump is our guy and we've got to support him if we want to win in November. I mean, why, what's going on? I asked him that about three times. Shockingly, the governor didn't really answer it. But <laughs> I, I think if I'm to kind of play midrash or interpret what he's doing here, is that in honor of Passover. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> is that the governor had said in his speech to the Republicans, no monkey business, no putting the thumb yeah. on the scale. And so presumably he would have thought he was putting his thumb on the scale or committing monkey business in that way. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good explanation. I think he's already done that by endorsing him after sure. the fact. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So keep it moving. Yeah. Spe well, speaking of Trump, yeah. was he endorsing a kinder, gentler Donald Trump? Don't count on it. Well, well, already don't count on it. We saw it yesterday. He Rosemary, got up I mean, here you've got Paul Manafort, who is uh, Trump's new managing guy, a real old hand, who shows up at the RNC meeting and says, 
this has just been an act, this Trump that you've seen, he can really be presidential. Um, and then the next day, Trump goes out and is the same brash, outspoken, outrageous Trump that we all know. I mean, this, this is Donald Trump. Right. And so what they're saying is that, you know, don't pay attention to everything he said. Well, he has said so much that there is really... He, how can he reframe the image that we all have of him when we will see clip after clip of how he speaks about Mexicans, Muslims, women, you name it. But isn't everybody who's a candidate an act? When you see a candidate get up, isn't that an act? The world's a stage. But I guess in, in <laughs> no. the case, in, in, but in the case of Trump, I agree with Rosemary. He, he does, he is at a significant disadvantage. And the big problem that he has is that early on when he was doing the wrong things and winning, it kind of embedded in his campaign's DNA that I don't need to be disciplined. And now th this is a time for discipline for Donald Trump. And the question is, is whether he has the discipline to be disciplined. Well, with, yeah. with less than 200 days to go to election day, there's a lot to fix on both sides. Unfortunately, on the GOP side, there's way more to fix. Yeah, than the Democrats. but there's plenty on the Democratic side. Certainly. We have a minute left. Before we run out of time, I, I do want to mention uh, uh, the death of Prince. We don't know exactly why or how he died. Nevertheless, a tremendous loss, but I was struck that, you know, not since Michael Jackson died has I seen the a, a outpouring of affection and respect and love for a performer. I mean, Marlon, why? Well, I live with think? one of the most uber fans of Prince. Um, she is um, still trying to get her arms around this. Um, he was one of the greatest musicians, but he was also a great philanthropist and activist as well. Many yeah. people may not know this. Um, his body is now cremated, which is going to bring some finality for um, those who celebrate him to kind of move yeah. on. And Beyonce is going to be here with us on Wednesday right here in Miami kicking off her tour. Right. And she certainly was close to him as well. You know, I think what people found in Prince was someone who wrote his own rules and succeeded yeah. by his own rules. And was brilliant. Sometimes very I mean, large Everything hurdles. he did, uh, yeah. even older white guys uh, <laughs> like me loved Prince. He was fabulous. And so Prince. young, died at such a young age. Yeah, he, he did. Well, thank you all. Wonderful comments, wonderful roundtable. Thanks so much. The sentence for Pat Santoramo, once the head of the Broward Teachers Union, we'll have that news after the break. It has been four years since the investigation into the former Broward Teachers Union boss began, and now Pat Santoramo is heading to prison, convicted of stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from teachers through their union. Local 10's Todd Tongan has been following the story from the beginning. He has this report. Flanked by lawyers and BSO Corrections deputies, former Broward Teachers Union President Pat Santoramo is handcuffed and let off to jail Friday to begin serving a five-year sentence in state prison. The union boss's journey to jail began in 2012 when an elaborate scheme to steal money from the union was uncovered and Santoramo's lavish lifestyle was revealed, including a half-million-dollar vacation home in Martin County. Along the way, Santoramo insisted he was innocent. But in January, Santorama was convicted. Eight of nine corruption charges, including money laundering and an organized scheme to defraud. As president of the teachers' union, he took kickbacks to the tune of $300,000. Broward teachers who trusted Santorama with their hard-earned money felt betrayed. Pat not only hurt our BTU members, but he tainted the reputation of BTU. He used us. Both the federal and circuit court judges who sentenced Santorama were perplexed by his brazen behavior. After all, the BTU head was pulling down nearly $200,000 a year. He had a generous $300 a month stipend for incidentals, and he used his credit card, union credit card, and racked up charges over $100,000 a year. After his sentencing, his lawyer said it could have been much worse. The state attorney demanded a 10-year sentence, and whatever sentence Mr. Santoramo ultimately serves will be far less than anything the state had requested or demanded. Before turning himself in to serve that state sentence, he was surrounded by his family at federal court. Santoramo was stunned when a federal judge made a departure from a plea deal guideline and sentenced the 67-year-old to 18 months in federal prison to be served after he gets out of state prison. And everyone, including the U.S. attorney, thought that sentence would run concurrently with his five-year sentence. I just think the breach of that public trust from the questions he asked of Mr. Santoramo, that he felt this was an independent case and he wanted to add an additional 18-month sentence. While pleading for mercy to the judge, Santoramo finally did accept responsibility. Your Honorable Judge Levison, I ask when making your final decision regarding 
this situation. I wish that you would consider all that I've done throughout my lifetime and take that into account. I ask for your compassion and leniency in my sentencing. But he never apologized to the hardworking teachers he was entrusted to represent as their advocate. Pat, anything you want to say to the teachers of Broward County? No comment. No comment. Really. If Santa Ramo finishes a drug and alcohol treatment program and then serves 85% of his time with good behavior, he could get out in five years. He would be 72 years old. In the video port for This Week in South Florida, Todd Tongan, Local 10 News. Todd, thank you so much. All right, still to come, my personal perspective about the birthday of the man I consider the greatest writer ever in the English language. Happy birthday, Bill Shakespeare.